Ooh, slightly different filming setup. Ooh, new things. Ooh, look what's behind me. Oh, this is a little plushie that is still available. If you would like one, it is a plushie of me. The link is in the description box. But this video is not about a plushie. Oh no, this video is about something I have actually been desperate to talk about and I've been excited about for years and now the video is finally getting made. Hey Spurds, how's it going? It's Jamie. Welcome back to another video. Your first video, your not first video, I don't know, but welcome either way. I'm so glad that you're here. Hope you're gonna enjoy it. Uh, today I'm talking all about my research, my PhD, my baby that's not a baby that's actually just a thesis. It's something I've been working on for a very long time. As some of you may know, I finished my PhD at the end of last year. I know, I am a doctor officially, not the medical kind, but still a doctor, Dr. Reigns. Well, that sounds weird. And over the time of me doing my doctoral research the past few years, I have mentioned it here and there, said I've been doing a PhD, doing research into trans people and things. Because of that, I have had many, many requests to talk about it and say what my research is, what my results are, just what I've been doing basically. So here I am today, and I can do this now because I have properly submitted my thesis, and a paper that I had accepted a while back has finally been published, so here I am today. This should be fun. Before I get fully into what I did with my research, there's a few things that I want to talk to you concerning research and things like that, kind of disclaimers, if you will, so bear with me. Number one, I've seen a number of people talking online about not liking scientific research, and, and particularly scientific research into trans people and issues. And this often comes from a place of feeling like if they personally don't fit with the results, then maybe their identity is being invalidated in some way, or that they are being forced into some kind of box and being told this is the way you need to be. I wanted to clarify that research is a game of averages, and whilst we can learn a lot from these averages and typically expected things, good research will never claim that you are absolutely one way, or that this is absolutely the only way to be, and mine is no exception. I did this research with the aim of understanding my own community a little better, increasing knowledge of trans people to the wider community, and bringing the academic field up to date with studies that are well designed as possible, that use more inclusive and current language. So please, please don't feel like if you don't fit with the results that I found or what I'm talking about, that you are in any way less valid. That is not what my research is intended to do. We're not talking about validity of identity here. We're just talking about increasing knowledge and offering scientific support behind some concepts, but if you don't fit with it, then that doesn't matter. Secondly, I wanted to let you know that academia can sometimes be slightly outdated, especially in terms of language. The research terms and methods can often feel clinical, outdated, restrictive, and often based off of stereotypes. Hence why I will be talking about averages quite a lot in today's video. <laughs> None of my findings are intended at all to say whether trans men are really men, because of course we are men regardless of what these results show. Though, little spoiler alert, they really do offer support. But this research is not supposed to be a tool of saying whether you're trans enough or not. No, that is not what it is about. I did this to increase knowledge and to also explore the distinction between assigned sex and gender identity. Finally, disclaimer number three, I'm nearly done. This is really the last one, I promise. My research for my PhD only includes transgender men. It takes time to carry out research and do it well, and I wanted to be able to focus in, gain the largest sample size possible, and do the best design of research that I could do. Hence why I only focused on one group of the trans community. But just because I only looked at trans men, it does not mean that trans women or non-binary people are not also important to be included in research going forward. If I ever do go into academia, my plan would be to open up the research a bit more and include all kinds of trans people, non-binary people, and just be very inclusive in the research. But with the time constraints of a PhD, I really didn't want to overstretch myself. So with those three little disclaimers out the way, let me tell you all about my research. My thesis is called Being Transgender, Effects of Behavior, Arousal, and Wellbeing. Basically, I looked into how transgender men compared to cisgender people specifically on these three components, behavior, arousal, and wellbeing. Being. First part of my research was behaviour. As I said, I do not like relying on stereotypes and fitting people into boxes in everyday life, but in a scientific context, typical behaviours and where most people fall within or not within these can be incredibly informative. So the basis for the first chapter of my thesis came from previous research, which had found that from a very, very young age, cisgender men who were gay were rated and reported themselves as being more feminine on average than cisgender men who are straight. And cisgender lesbians 
lesbians were found to be reported and rated themselves as being more masculine than straight cisgender women. This is called sex atypicality, and it's where people report, are rated, or appear, or feel themselves as being atypical to other people with the same assigned sex. I looked into the same concept in transgender men, and I found that they were rated and considered themselves as being incredibly masculine from a very young age. This started from around three years of age and carried on throughout adulthood. And this was found regardless of transition status. So whether somebody had socially transition, taking medical steps, surgery, regardless of the transition stage, they were considered and considered themselves as being more masculine. Basically, trans guys felt that they did not fit into the stereotypical expectations of being a girl, and other people also considered them as being non-conforming as compared to cisgender women. And this went significantly beyond the sex atypicality that was found in cisgender lesbians. This pattern also differed somewhat within transgender men depending on their sexual orientation. So straight transgender men were rated and reported themselves as being more masculine than non-straight transgender men. And this is the same pattern that we find in cisgender men. First study component, done. We looked into behavior, very cool. The second part of my study was into sexual arousal. And just before we get into this, I wanna do a little disclaimer that there will be discussions of genitals, nothing too graphic, but I just wanna pop a little warning in there right now. So where the first part was looking into a behavioral component, this part was looking into a biological pattern in transgender men. Again, this was based off of previous research that looked into differences between cisgender men and cisgender women. And what these previous results found is that cisgender men and women show different patterns of genital sexual arousal whilst watching erotic videos that feature either a cisgender man or a cisgender woman. So whenever somebody came into the lab, they would be seated in a completely private booth and they would then proceed to watch erotic videos featuring either a lone cisgender man or a lone cisgender woman whilst their genital arousal was measured using a vaginal probe or penile gauge. What we know from previous research is that for cisgender men, if he was a straight cisgender man, he would typically only show arousal to women. And if he was a gay cisgender man, he would typically only show arousal to men. And this genital arousal correlate strongly with self-reported attraction. Among cisgender women, however, typically what we find is arousal to both the videos featuring men and the videos featuring women, regardless of their sexual orientation. This does not mean, however, that all cisgender women are bisexual. No. The sexual orientation that they know they are is still very much valid. But in terms of how their genital arousal will unconsciously respond, cisgender women typically do not show much difference between their responses to videos featuring men and videos featuring women. My question here was, is this difference driven by a difference in assigned sex or a difference in gender identity? If cisgender men's genital arousal typically follows their self-reported attraction, but cisgender women's doesn't, will transgender men like me respond more like cisgender men and therefore in line with our gender identity? Or would we respond more like cisgender women and therefore assigned birth sex has more of an influence over this component? So I had a bunch of transgender men take part in the study, including myself. Most most had not had bottom surgery, so used the same arousal measurement device as cisgender women. But some had had a type of bottom surgery called metoidioplasty, and in those cases, we used the same device as used for cisgender men, which as a side note is very cool too, because we could actually measure genital arousal in the same way in transgender men who had had metoidioplasty as we measure in cisgender men, indicating that functionally, the penis of trans men is very similar to the penis of cis men. Just a little bit smaller. The short story here is that I found that transgender men show genital arousal patterns that are more similar to cisgender men than cisgender women. And this was found regardless of which measurement device was used. They weren't completely identical in their patterns to cisgender men, but they were substantially closer in their arousal patterns to cisgender men than they were to cisgender women. This indicates that something that was previously seen purely as a difference based on a person's assigned sex actually may be a difference and may be influenced influenced by somebody's gender identity. And it also shows a similarity in a biological process between transgender men and cisgender men. In other words, transgender men show a biological response that is in line with their gender. This was huge. To me. The final part of my research looked into well-being. I think anecdotally we can all agree that LGBT plus people have poorer mental health than cisgender straight people. The results here are fairly simple in that transgender men reported the lowest well-being and the highest rates of depression and anxiety as compared to cisgender people of various sexual orientations. But that the further along in their transition that they got, the better their well-being was. A side note and a really interesting thing that we found is that transgender men who had had top surgery or 
further surgical stages had comparable well-being to cisgender people. This is the shortest section to explain because basically trans people before transitioning have significantly poorer mental health than cisgender people, but that transitioning drastically and significantly improves this well-being. This might sound really obvious to you if you are part of the community or if you know a trans person or if you are trans yourself. Of course, it seems obvious that transitioning in some way will improve your well-being, but sometimes there's a real strength in having these things that we already know being shown and supported in science. There's a power in publishing and it really helps to normalize and spread the message. And so I hope that's what my research can help do for the trans community. Just increase knowledge in some way and understanding because I really think increasing knowledge and understanding is a key component to increasing acceptance. So in short, my research over the past quite a few years has shown that one, trans men have significantly worse mental health than cisgender people before transitioning, but that the further along in transition that they get, the better this mental health gets. Two, transgender men show biological similarities to cisgender men in their genital sexual arousal, really offering some support that gender identity exists, is separate, and can be different to a person's assigned sex. And finally, number three, transgender men show behavioral similarities to cisgender men and differences to cisgender women, starting from a very early age, as young as three years old, and carrying on into adulthood. That's it. It's been a tricky, stressful, infuriating few years. But I'm so glad that this research is now out there in the world. I just really hope that it's taken in the way that I've always intended it to be taken as further support for the transgender community and furthering the knowledge that we have around trans people and around gender identity. And yeah, that's it. Leave your comments down below. Let me know what you think. Let me know your opinions. And yeah, I just really hope that other people think this research is like as cool as I do. I don't know if you will. I feel like I think it's cool because I did it. But yeah, let me know what you think of the comments. I'm not going to waffle here. If you like this video, think about giving it a thumbs up and subscribing, but no pressure. And yeah, as always, thank you so, so much for watching. I'll see you next time. Much love. Bye.